Welcome to the A Minute to Midnight show. This is Tony, and today on the show we have Doc Marquis returning. Doc was on the show a few weeks ago. Today's subject is one that I find really, really fascinating. I know that other members of our team, Brooke, Matt and Joni, all love this sort of subject as well, and that's the topic of giants. The Bible accounts and also accounts from other parts of the world Doc has done a lot of field work and research on that topic and he brings out a lot of it in this great interview. We welcome back to the A Minute to Midnight show, Doc Marquis. We had you on a few weeks ago, Doc, and I was really looking forward to having you back and the discussion today on giants will be awesome. That's a a fascinating subject. But I I also had a few people asking about your testimony, um, how you got saved, so maybe you could... uh, begin a little bit on that well my testimony was actually a bit long because it took three years of christian witnessing to do it but let's see um let let me think it was back in 76 i was serving in the united states army at the time um in fort at fort lewis in washington state and i was walking down the road i needed to go to the px to get some supplies when this one um, other person from the medical world, you know, you know, an associate, not, n- no one I really knew that well, but he walked up to me and struck up a conversation. And about 10 minutes later, he had to leave. But before he left, he asked me what I thought was the silliest question on God's earth. He asked me if I wanted to go to church with him on Sunday. <laughs> You know, now, could you see me, Tony? I mean, I'm an Illuminati witch at the time. Could you see me going into a Christian church then? No. I mean, come, I mean, come on. We know the raptors would have fallen on me. <laughs> you know, but be that as it may, um, for the next three years of my life, no matter where I went and, I, and no matter how far I went, and I went all the way to Germany, there was some born again Christian just waiting in the rafters to witness to me. <laughs> and uh, this is a true story. I'm not lying when I say this. I remember in Germany, when I was walking down the, um, the road, I saw this white van just zip past me. All of a sudden, um, the door flew open. You know, those side doors they have on them. Yeah. And even before the vehicle was completely stopped, someone jumped out of it with a Bible. <laughs> I'm going, you have got to be kidding me. You know, I was beginning to wonder just how completely bonkers are these Christians. (laughs) Well, anyways, eventually what had happened, at the end of those very long three years of Christian witnessing, I finally understood what the Christians were saying to me in light of what I was doing. So it was on April 15th, and I will never forget that date. It was in 1979. I walked into a Christian church, and I admit it, I was a sold-out slave of Satan. But on that very same day, God be praised, I left as a child of the king. And for almost 40 years now, I'd been um, telling people and warning them about the Illuminati their plans for a new world order, the corruption in governments that they've caused throughout the world, so on and so forth. And um, God has put me in this ministry. And as far as I see it, Tony, I'm going to keep going until he calls me home. That sounds great. Yeah, excellent. Um, And a great witness it is too. And in fact, you know, we, we talked a little bit about some of the Illuminati and Freemasonry stuff last time, but getting into the subject of giants, which is is something, did you learn much about giants when you were in the Illuminati? Well, you know, it's interesting. When I was around ooh, 12 or 13, I learned about ancient giants in America through the Illuminati. Now, I didn't hear about the biblical side of this until I became a born again Christian. But the Illuminati are very well versed in the ancient giants. They told me 
um, a particular story, I'll never forget this story, that throughout America um, in the distant past, giants roamed freely throughout the Americas. And they would, you know, um, you know, just run through the plains. They would grab buffaloes, deers, whatever, or they'd raid these Native American villages and they'd take whatever, you know, um, maybe cattle they had or whatever. And according to some of the accounts, they even took the people and ate them. Mm. And nothing could stop these gigantic creatures. I mean, um, going by what the Bible teaches us, um, any, any giants could be as tall as nine and a half feet to 40 feet in height. Now, nine and a half feet would have been the size of the giant Goliath, as mentioned in the Bible. Yeah. And according to the Bible, there were these giants that was also the size of a cedar tree. Interesting enough, the average height of a cedar tree is 40 feet. Well, anyways, so these poor um, people who were living in the, in the Americas, I'm talking North and South America now, they were being helpless and hapless victims to these giants that was just doing whatever they wanted to with impunity. Finally, someone came up with the bright idea since not one tribe is capable of, you know, withstanding these creatures, what if we banded together and went on the, and went on the offensive? Of course, I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. And that's exactly what they did. A number of tribes united together and they started hunting the giants down. And according to the story I was told in the Illuminati, the giants um, were hunted down to extinction in that part of the world. And um, towards the end, they cornered uh, something like a dozen or 15 giants in this one cave. And the tribes, they were, you know, throwing in spears, um, shooting arrows, um, using rocks, you know, like slingshots, you know, to, uh, you know, to force them out. But the giants would not come out. And so finally, they lit this huge fire in front of this cave to smoke him out and rather than come out the giants suffocated to death and where i've been doing my field work is in that same area where those giants were supposed to have been you know suffocated to death now if you understand the american indian mindset you know their culture and everything that cave would be considered a cursed cave now because they died there and no one would ever set foot in it again. Now that means, Tony, somewhere in the area where I've been searching, there's a cave with the actual skeletal remains of about 12 to 15 giants. Now, could you imagine what we could do if we actually found that cave. What state is that in? I'm not saying right now because I don't want people to just frantically run into this area because, first of all, you have to have a very high degree of survival skill to survive in this type of area. We're talking about, you know, you know this place is so huge and it's such a desert area that you could easily get lost and die in it. Plus, we have to consider the rattlesnakes, the um, spiders, you know, the poisonous ones, um, the mountain lions, and other such creatures. And these people, as I said, unless you have a high degree of survival skills, you're going to die there. Yeah. Now, I'm military trained in this, so I know what I'm doing. Second... This is um, a private area. You cannot gain access to it unless, you're, unless you receive special permission from the tribal elders. And fortunately, I've been given that on a silver platter. And um, I, I can tell you right now, leading archaeologists around the world have been dying to get into this area. 
But the tribal elders, they won't allow them. They know they don't trust them. They've seen how they've um, ruined other parts of their lands in the past, and they will not allow them there. And as I said, fortunately, I was doing a um, week-long series of um, seminars in that area about five, six years ago, and I didn't know about it, but there was a number of the elders in attendance, and um, they loved the way I talked about, you know, the culture there, the respect I do have for them, and, you know, my teachings from the Bible. And so they basically asked me if I would like to search in that area. And what's really interesting, Tony, when I told them the stories I learned about the ancient giants to them, they confirmed to me that's exactly the same cultural stories that's been passed down to them for somewhere between 1,000 to 1,500 years. Wow. Yeah, that's how long ago the giants were in that area. And I can verify this because of the number of petroglyphs I've been finding. I have found in my search in that area Um, the ancient petroglyphs of these giants, and they fit exactly to the description found in the Bible. We're talking about creatures of enormous height with six fingers, um, six toes, capable of massive feats of strength. I've even found, um, and I've, I've got all these obviously in my library, but I found one particular petroglyph. This thing, I can guarantee you, hasn't seen the light of day for, well, no one's seen it for a good 1,500 years. It shows a a hunting scene. There's a Tyrannosaurus Rex, if you can believe it, a T-Rex now. And you know they average, according to archaeologists, somewhere between 25 to 30 feet, if I recall correctly. There's a giant standing right next to it. And to show the comparison... There's a normal-sized human being standing next to the giant, and all these animals are running away from the T-Rex and the giants. And you're saying this is, what, 1,500 years old? It has to be at least that um, by where it was located. We are talking about on top of this one mountainous region that is extremely difficult to climb up. And trust me, you know, um, when in my younger days, I used to do a lot of free climbing. I'm not getting any younger, but God be praised, I can still climb up a mountain. In order to find this particular petroglyph, you have to climb almost all the way to the top. You have to um, go around all these boulders. And on the opposite side, um, you will find that boulder, but the boulder is facing towards the inside of the mountain, so you have to walk around that boulder so you can find that particular scene. In my DVD, um, in my series, uh, my DVD is called There Were Giants in the Earth. I take everyone from the very beginning, when we first hear of ancient giants, according to the Bible, and we bring it up to present date. Now, I know for a fact that particular um, photo is in it. I made sure of it because this is one of those rare finds you just yeah. don't find, you know, every day of your life. That's yes. for sure. And um, and you wouldn't well, want the Smithsonian Institute to get a hold of it; <laughs> it'd disappear uh, forever. <laughs> well, you well, you know, well, you know, the funny thing is they they can um, do whatever they want at this point. I've got all the photos. I've got the evidence. You know, I know exactly where all this stuff is to this very date. So um, I put all this into that DVD called There Were Giants in the Earth. And and as I said, we're bringing it up to present day. And without giving away too much, let me just tell you this. There is a direct connection between giants and little gray aliens. Ah. And and you bring that out in the DVD. Oh, yeah. There was a direct connection. Because you see... Where I've also been um, doing my field work, 
you will find these ancient stone circles, you know, um, similar to, you know, the ones you'll find like in um, Gobekli Tepe, Nibali Kore, or um, even Stonehenge. Though I'll tell you this much, people just think that these um, ancient stone circles, you know, like, well, the most famous would be like Stonehenge. Yeah. Um, people think that those were just, you know, those are just found in the British Isles, and that's not true. You can find um, these great stone circles in places like Portugal, um, Russia, Australia, in um, Massachusetts, here in the United States. Um, there's a famous um, um, megalithic stone circles in Brazil, and then and then there are the, um, the smaller ones like the uh, Nata Playa that you'll find in um, Egypt, the ones in Poland, um, oh, my goodness, Sweden. You know, you just have to know where to look, but they're there. Yeah. The ancient world had these stone circles just about everywhere, just like it almost seems everywhere you look, there was a place that had pyramids, you know, and there are connections here. That we're just not considering. Now, with the stone circles, and this is most important, and I do show this on um, on that DVD, There Were Giants in the Earth. Stone circles um, were built by the ancient giants. Quite a number of them were. We even have um, stories in England where it tells that... Um, Oh, there was a particular nasty um, giant known as Gog Magog that did the same thing um, like the ones in um, the Americas. He would just rampage throughout the countryside and basically do whatever he wanted. I mean, the thing is, when you when we look at ancient giants, you're going to find um, cultural stories that deal with ancient giants. And where you find these cultural stories – you're going to find archaeological evidence of their existence. And where you find the archaeological evidence, you're going to find stone circles. And where you find these stone circles, you're going to find crop circles. And where you find um, those stone circles again, you're going to find demonic activity. I have got on film... And I mean, this is the genuine stuff. I have gone through thousands of pieces of different films over, I don't know, how long. And for the first time, we have on film, from beginning to end, two genuine demonic manifestations from the beginning to the end. That's interesting. Yep. Now, I, ju I just want to ask you, talking about Stonehenge, what do the legends in the British Isles actually say about the building of Stonehenge? Who built it? Well, okay. Well, if we go by um, a combination, let's say, of um, archaeology and um, the old stories, stone, stone circles like Stonehenge, the one in Avesbury Hems and things like that, were built by the ancient Druids. The Druids were the um, priestly class of the, of the nomadic people known as the Celts. And the Celts were a very barbaric, vicious type of tribal people. The function of these stone circles um, so was, um, first of all, they served as temples of religious worship. Second, they were also astrological observatories. I think you know that one. Yeah. And the third pl third reason for their existence was that they were used as places for the observance of human sacrifice. Underneath Stonehenge alone, archaeologists have unearthed over 4,000 human skeletal remains, and they can show you that they were human sacrifices. Mm. Now, mind you, that's a small stone circle. The one in Avesbury is more than a mile in circumference. So you can imagine how many people must be underneath that one. In England alone, not just England, Ireland, Scotland, that part of the world, 95% of all crop circles can be found. 
only 5% are found in other places throughout the world. So what is there about the British Isles that connect these crop formations to the stone circles? And that's one of the many mysteries we get into in this DVD. One of the main reasons, and archaeologists are not going to look at it for this reason, but since we know it's a place of religious service, one of the main purposes of places like Stonehenge, um, the ones in Gobekli Tepe, Nevali Kore, so on and so forth, was to summon demons. We have, when, when we go back to the Bible, we know that um, of those third of the angels that followed um, Lucifer during the great rebellion and which caused the war in heaven, they were cast to the earth. And um, I don't even know how many were, you know, confined and chained, you know, to the bottomless pit. Yeah. But we do know not every single one was confined to the pit at that point. There are demons that are roaming the earth, as the Bible says. And it's for this reason, shortly after they were cast, that under um, Satan's guidance, the very first genetic experiment in human history happened. That's when the fallen angels that weren't consigned to the pit at the time mated with female human beings and produced a new race, a hybrid, known as giants. And these giants, now it's interesting. When we look at the old tales, and I, and I mean all the, I mean the really old stuff that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, some even thousands, um, you never hear of a benevolent or benign giant. No, giants were always vicious, ravenous creatures. I mean, I mean, the classic tale of Jack and the Beanstalk, for instance. Yes. You know, um, the story of, as I said, Gog Magog in England. Um, we, we go through the various cultures and you'll never find a giant that was benign. But um, the point here is that these giants um, were, you know, became these horrible, ill-tempered creatures because of who their fathers were. Their fathers were the fallen angels. Knowing that their power, you know, the um, fallen angels, the demons, um, it became terribly limited. During the fall, most of them lost, I'd say, 90% of their natural abilities. Knowing that their powers were now limited, they had their offspring create these stone circles throughout the world so that they could literally be summoned up later on, you know, down the road. And the fact of the matter is, as it says, when you view this footage that is just down the road from that stone circle I was speaking about, where you see these two demonic manifestations, it's on that film. The evidence is there uh, on that DVD called There Were Giants in the Earth. And when we look at the second demonic manifestation, I mean, the very second it begins to manifest, you can actually see the interdimensional portal open up that the demon is coming through. You can see it. You can actually see the portal. And this is what I've been telling people to look for for over 30 years now. I mean, people are going bonkers thinking that CERN is going to open up these doors or, you know, this Stargate stuff is going to open the door. It doesn't work like that. It never has and never will. You will see on that film for yourself now, the the way the interdimensional portal opens up, the demon slips from the fourth dimension into the third dimension, and just as he leaves the portal, you can see it closing behind him. And that portal, I'd say, is about 10 to 12 feet off the ground when he first begins to manifest. 
That sounds fascinating. You, you just have to sit down and look at it. I mean, the evidence is right there. It can't be denied. Now, mind you, I knew in my heart of hearts that there'd be a number of skeptics on this, thinking that this was some sort of CGI thing or something like that. Yeah. And quite honestly, I wouldn't even know how to begin to do anything <laughs> like that. Nevertheless, I had the actual footage from the security cameras now sent in not once, but twice to two different places to have it authenticated. And both times, they went all the way down to the infrared now to see if any pixel had been altered one way or the less. And the findings were both times it is what it is. Well, wow, that's that's a good enough reason in itself to to watch that DVD, let alone all the other great information in there. Um, well, you'll have to remind me. Um, send me an email. I'll, I'll send you a copy of that DVD so you can see it for yourself. The footage is absolutely amazing. It sounds it. Yeah, I'd be definitely absolutely keen to watch that. And I know um, our friend Matt, who's part of our team, uh, the Giants, is, that's a big thing he's into, so he would love to see it as well. So what what can you actually tell us about Darius the Mede? Well, if we go by the ancient account, Darius the Mede himself was supposed to have been a giant. Not on the tall end, you know, like 40 feet. Yeah. But there is an interesting relief and I do ha- and I did show it in this particular DVD. There were giants in the earth. I'm I, I'm I'm almost shocked you know, um, that you knew anything about Darius because most people don't know it, that Darius the Mede, who was, you know, the head of, you know, the Persian Empire yeah. and all the soldiers and all this, there's a very ancient um, stella that shows Darius the Mede as he had conquered part of this ancient army. And when you look at the stella itself, it says a lot. Because there's about, okay, if we were to split this stella down the middle, okay, and we look towards, let's say, the right-hand half of it, you see, oh, about nine or ten different soldiers, um, their hands are tied behind their back, and you know how they always tied a rope around them, you know, when they were forming like a group? Yeah. Now, that would be on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, you could see... Darius the Mede and a couple of his soldiers behind him, Darius himself is almost twice as tall as all of those soldiers. Very interesting. You know, and mind you, now that was ancient Persia. Yeah. And it's in that part of the world where Gobekli Tepe and the Valley Kore exist. And in those two areas, in both of them, you find they look almost exactly the same type of stone circles you'll find at Stonehenge. Wow. Again, yeah. wherever you find these giants, you will begin to find these stone circles. Check the cultural stories. That will give you the clue where you need to start looking. And it's, at, and it's in that same area that um, they found um, remnants of these um, double-headed axes. Except the thing is, these axes, the axe head alone, is about four to four and a half feet wide, and they stand about 10, 11 feet tall. Mm, massive. Now, we, we, we would just apply common sense here. Who in their right mind, what normal average sized human being would construct such a weapon? Nobody. They couldn't wield it. No, you couldn't wield it. Exactly. But we've got three of them um, in this one museum that's in Baghdad in Iraq where you can um, where you can see them. These things are massive. I can't even begin to imagine 
how heavy they must be. Yeah. But they were found in the same area as as um, Darius would have been in, which is the same area where you find Gobekli Tepe and Abali Kore. And here's the interesting, the really interesting thing about it. Gobekli Tepe, which is below Nivali Kore, is about oh, 50 to, I'd say, 75 kilometers away from the northernmost point of ancient Canaan. You remember it was in Canaan that Og of Bashan had resided? Yep, yep, we find him in Deuteronomy chapter 3, I think, verse 11. Yep. Right, and, and we find out his bed um, um, was made out of, I think, iron yeah. and that. Nine it had cubits. To be What's that? It was nine cubits long, I believe. Right, which is a, which is a bit more than fifteen feet. Yeah, be, because Agabashan was so tall, he was a giant. Yeah. Well, anyways, if we look at the numbers in the Bible very carefully, and when I say the numbers, you have to look at the um, how many giants resided in in the in the cities in the countryside, and certain other places, and all this other stuff, right? Yeah. When, when we run the numbers, in the ancient land of Canaan, there was approximately one million giants. How do you arrive at that number? Well, as it says, you have to go to the Bible, look at how many giants resided in different cities, in the towns, and other places. It takes a while to go uh, to go through all that material, but you can extrapolate the numbers. Wow, I, I know in Deuteronomy two twenty one it says, "Are people great and many and tall as the Anakims were? Well, the Anakims or the sons of Anak, which we know Og of Bashan was, who you've already told us was about fifteen feet or more tall. So that does tell us that there were a lot. Well, there was more than a lot because the thing is, if, um, according to the count, if I've counted correctly, there was approximately 40 different tribes, giants. Uh-huh. Okay. Now, think about this for a moment. You're Satan. You've got a million giants in Canaan, ancient Canaan now. Why have you concentrated a million giants there of all places? Good point. And there's an e- and there's an even more interesting point. If you look at an ancient uh, at the ancient map of Canaan, you'll find dead center and to the left of the Red Sea, a little unknown place back then known as Bethlehem of Judea. Was, is that when you, yes, is that when the bell? Yeah, where Jesus was born. Yeah. Exactly where the Lord was born. You see, the reason there was a million giants there. And you have to be in the Illuminati, or maybe some of the cult group might teach this, I'm not certain. But in the Illuminati, it is taught that if you can stop or unravel just one prophecy, I mean just one prophecy from the Bible, then all the other prophecies will come to naught because then God can't really be God. And they were trying to stop the prophecy of the Messiah, the one person who could stop him from being born in Bethlehem of Judea. However, God already had a counter plan to that. Remember, he sent in 12 spies um, into Canaan under the orders of Joshua, you, you know, Joshua and Caleb, and well, under Moses, and 10 others went in, right? Yeah. When they came back, the um, 10 spies that went together, they said, there's no way we can go in there and inhabit that place. The, um, the, the people living there, we are, uh, we are as the size of a grasshopper in comparison to them. And their city walls reach up to heaven. Now, think, think of about a wall so tall it appears to reach up to heaven itself, that means those walls, and there's a lot in the DVDs I have to show you, but um, those walls would have to be at least as tall as the Great Pyramid um, you'd find on the Giza Plateau. Wow. And 
if you recall, when Joshua and Caleb came back, they came back <clears throat> with one cluster of grapes. But this cluster of grapes was so big, they had to um, tie it, connect it to a pole that they would carry on their shoulders between them just to bring it back. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, huge yeah. is and is understating it because yeah. have you ever heard of the tale of Sinewe? No, I, I don't think I have. Well, I may okay. have, but it doesn't ring a bell. Well, no, I, I'm not surprised because this is um oh th this is um a, an account of we believe it's a merchant who is known <laughs> as Sinewe. We believe that's what his name was. Um, wh wh what it is, is there was this ancient, like, um, it was a huge rock or stone. It was something like that. Really, really big. And carved into the rock itself is what we nowadays call the tale of Sinoe. It talks of a merchant who went into the same area as Joshua and Caleb, you know, this guy. It looks like, according to the tale, um, was basically on vacation or holiday there. And according to his account, that land was so fertile and all this stuff grew in such abundance that, according to Sinoe now, there was more wine than water. This is an outside biblical source yeah. which validates what Joshua and Caleb also saw. So it, it originates from the same period of time, does it? It, it? That's the beautiful thing about it. It's the same time in the same area. Yeah, okay. That's amazing. Yeah. And according to Sinoe now, that's what he saw. As I said, he um, stated that, that there was more wa um, wine flowing than water. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, that definitely correlates um, with what yeah. we what you've just said about yeah from the story of Joshua and the grapes. I mean, you can understand why the other ten spies were terrified, can't you? Uh, and it shows you how brave Caleb and Joshua were, or how much they trusted God that they'd even attempt to take people in there. Well, that, that's the beauty of Joshua and Caleb. We, when they came back from what they saw and even carrying that huge, gigantic cluster of grapes, even they said, <coughs> oh, it's not a problem, Moses, we can take them out. Yeah, that's that's pretty staggering when you, you, you start to really think. You know, we're not talking giants that were seven and a half feet or something. We're talking huge people. Um, yeah. Remember, it was... Hundreds and hundreds and hundred years down the road, where um, David contended against the small end of a giant that was nine and a half feet tall. Yeah, yeah. And and all and just like Joshua and Caleb, that little shepherd boy had enough faith to say, "My God is going to take you down." Yeah, yeah. And it's a, it's a pretty amazing story. And, and you know. Uh, that that fact that it just shows you how brave and how well not just brave but how much these people trusted in God and why uh, why they you know fathers of the faith that we look to like David and Joshua and people like that to have even yeah. contemplate what they did is pretty amazing. Well, that's just it. If you have the faith, there's nothing you can't do. Yeah, yeah. that's the only difference between us and the 12 apostles. They had faith. We, most born-again Christians nowadays, they have entertainment. They go to their churches, and when you can no longer tell the difference between a church service and a rock and roll service then you know something's wrong yeah i totally agree yeah them, a lot of them are like nightclubs oh my god thank you yeah that's exactly what you would call it christian nightclubs yeah i agree yeah. hey just um going back to the giants with the you mentioned the six fingers and six toes uh what about double rows of teeth a lot of the a lot of them oh, had that. Not, oh well not only did they have double rows of teeth some had triple 
Ah. Yeah. And um, um, some of these giants, according to the petroglyphs now, um, if, they're, if, um, if they're not giants with horns, then these are depictions of demons. Yeah. Uh, according to um, the elders I've spoken to, and they said that some of the giants had horns. And if we go by the ancient accounts, you know, we go through other cultures and civilizations. We know in the um, Greek mythology, you have the ancient Titans. Yeah. It's from the ancient Titans we would have um, got Cyclops um, from. Yeah. And they had, and they had horns. Um, we go um, to Norse mythology. You had what was known as the Bifrost Giants. And a number of them, according to the ancient pictographs and such, um, they had horns. Um, the ones in Roman mythology, I don't remember them having horns. I really can't say one way or the other on that one. Um, but it's possible. I won't, shall we say, carve it in stone. Um, but it's possible that some of the giants in ancient America had horns. I can't swear to it because... There's no um, skeletal frames right now that's been discovered that we could present. But one thing is certain, uh, when we look at the archaeological evidence around the world, there are skeletal remains that will verify there were giants in this uh, on this earth. One of the things that, um, for me, I kind of think, I, there's, a, there's photographs around and things, but it's very hard to determine what are hoaxes and what are genuine photographs. And, and, well, and that. well, that's why you want to go to, if you're going to check photographs, don't check for photographs after 1995 because that's when the computer was invented. You know, as far as the internet and all that other stuff. Yeah, yeah. You want to go to the stuff that was before that because you should be able to find the original photo and um, what it looked like. Now, I have got quite a number of old, I'm talking about old photos now, some that were taken back in the late 1800s now. Yeah. That will show um, the remnant of giants and I've got photos also that will show like um, it. It's hard to describe, but it looks almost like, shall we say, the ancient version of a guitar, except the bottom part is not. It doesn't look like a bell shape or a figure eight. It looks more like just a rectangle with with strings going up to a handle. Now, this particular guitar, it's seven feet tall. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, who could play that? Yeah. Um, I've, got, I've got photos of, an, of what looks like an ancient cup, except this must be at least 15 to 20, no, 10 to 15 feet maybe in circumference. I've, I've got another photo of an ancient crown that was discovered, and this crown... And, and you can see it in the photo. They, they use this for a comparison. It would take about four human heads before that thing would fit on. And this is an old photograph, not a recent one. Right. Wow, yeah, well, that's huge. It's, it's now, what's even more interesting is the place where I've been doing my field work. Now, as I said, I've been following the petroglyphs, but there's also these carvings in stone that show um, what a giant's hand would look like. And the photos I've got will show you on um, those Native American Indians carved into the rock walls now, a hand that has six fingers on it. And that's not a mistake. I mean, it shows a series of these hands. And they each have six fingers on it. Yeah, and that correlates with the Bible accounts of the giants with six fingers as well. 
Exactly. And it also agrees with the petroglyphs. And we also have from those same areas what can only be described as um, pterosaurs. You know, it's you know that's where you would get the um, pterodactyls from. Yeah, yeah. From the family of pterosaurs. Yep. Yeah. And um, these are petroglyphs now. These wow. are actual. Pe- See, but one thing that convinces me of the authenticity of what I've been finding in that area is that when we look at various cultures and, you know, when they left, you know, like these steles reliefs or temple drawings or things like that. Yeah. A lot of them embellish things. Uh, uh, Just a quick example. If we look at some of the temple complexes in Egypt, for instance, well, you will see um, a normal sized human being, and then you will see one of their pharaohs that's um, usually depicted two, three times bigger than a normal human being. Yeah. Now, is that because those pharaohs were giants? No. It's because, according to their, to their culture, those pharaohs were actual gods, so they were depicted to be bigger than a normal human being. You know, that's just embellishment or what we would call a literary license. But you will not find that in anything related to the petroglyphs of Native American Indians. They didn't embellish. They just put down what they saw and that was it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yep, that makes sense. That's just the way all their recorded history have been that's just the way it is for them we don't embellish we just put down what we saw and let the chips fall wherever they may yeah okay that there that's very interesting and another thing we just we look at some of the say south america you know the um, constructions there that they're just so huge that you know nobody could have uh, normal human beings could have could have constructed something that big, even today's technology. Well, you know, I can tell you about some of the ways that they could have built certain um, structures, like the obelisk and pyramid, and you know, the obelisk you'll find in Egypt and such like that. That, believe it or not, um, would not have required a giant to stand it up. No. Um. Um, the huge blocks that we see in the construction of the pyramids and um, places like Rome and Greece and places like that, you know, where we see these great, um, was a giant needed? No. It has been proven that they actually had um, saws that could cut through those boulders, it was based on using water power. I saw the actual live demonstration. You had to see this to believe it, but it was incredible. Now, does that mean all of these ancient structures were built by man? No, I don't think so. There are, according to the Bible, and this is what's interesting, we know that um, the... um, Israelites were held captive by Egypt for 430 years. And there is an account in the Bible that does tell us there were giants in Egypt. So I can't help but wonder, perhaps maybe a couple of giants here and there may have given hand. I don't know. My my personal opinion I don't think giants had a hand in the building of the pyramids, but I do know from different um, accounts throughout the world, giants were responsible for quite a number of those ancient structures. Yeah, a lot of them, some of the huge stones that weigh many tons were obviously quarried a long, long way away from where the constructions were made. Which yeah is again a whole how they, on earth did they get them there and why? Well, you know it would you know and common sense would um, tell me well, human beings a normal human beings couldn't pick it, but 
a giant could. And if he couldn't lift it by himself, he'd call a friend over and, hey, you grab one and I grab the other. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting. There's um, a stone circle um, in the Golan Heights. I mean, this thing is massive. I mean, I think it has three or four concentric circles, you know, that goes towards the center. Yeah. And um, as I recall, that particular stone circle, I mean, it is, when, when I say it's huge, I mean, I think it's, it's, oh, I think it's something like over 500 something feet in diameter or something like that. This thing is really, really big. Yeah. Now, in the Hebrew tongue, it's called Gilgal Rephaim. Now, that translates from the from the Hebrew as the ghost wheel or the wheel of giants. Ah, very, very interesting. Now, this structure in particular, it's made up of 42,000 basalt stones, and it dates back all the way to 5,000 years ago. And here's the rub of it. In Gilgal Rephaim, 5,000 years ago, there was nothing there. I mean, there was no trade routes, no city, no towns, no nothing. However, going by the biblical account, in that region of the world, 5,000 years ago, there were giants. Uh, there is oh, there's just so much to this. I mean, we could go for hours talking about this. <laughs> um, well, that's why I make these DVDs exactly. so I can show it all to the people. I mean, this particular DVD I put together, um, it's called um, There Were Giants in the Earth. It's two parts. Uh, no, it's one part. I think it's one part. And as I recall, I think it's three and a half, four hours long. It took me months to put that together because there was so much information and I had to show all the connections. You know, there's five major connections if you understand the stories of the ancient giants, but um, it can easily be proven if you just follow it carefully. And But as I said, that's why it took me so long, um, you know, three and a half, four hours to explain it all. Yep, and we'll definitely have to watch that. And and I would say our listeners should get a hold of it as well. So they can get a hold of it at your website, which is you might want to give it to them now. Oh, yeah, at my website, um, just go to www. Now, the rest is going to be all lowercase, no apostrophes. Just put in www. It's a God thing productions. Now, that's with an S. It's a God Thing Productions 777.com. Or um, if, if you're not sure how to work or anything, you can just send me an email at um, docmarkey777 at yahoo.com. You know, very easy to get a hold of me. That sounds great. And, um, yeah, well, I, I, for one, will definitely be wanting to watch this DVD. So um, this has been another fascinating discussion. Uh, I'm really, really glad we've had it today again, Doc. And um, so thank you for coming on the show, and I'd love to have you come back again uh, sometime in the next few months. Sure. It'll be my pleasure. So, yeah, that's great. We'll have to organise that. So uh, it's been brilliant. Thank you very much again for coming on our show. Well, folks, you can find all of our shows as audio download on our website a minute to midnight.com or also at iTunes and we put them out on YouTube as well but we always have archives on our a minute to midnight website of all of our shows and also articles that we post regularly and we do run a minute to midnight 100% by donations and there is a donation button on the website I want to say thank you to the people that help us out and if anyone else wants to help us out then you will be welcome we'd love that as well and I write play and record all the music in our shows and you can find my music some free download music on our website as well Uh, that's about it on behalf of the a minute to midnight team this is Tony signing off catch you again soon